Okay, welcome back. This is chapter 12. Chapter 12 is kind of odd because it kind of leaves all the rest of the stuff behind and talks about computer architecture and infrastructure and things that, quite frankly, you probably should have needed at the beginning of the course, not at the end. But hey, I didn't write the textbook. So let's start with the learning objectives. So what we're supposed to learn is uh, the components of a computer, you know, the memory and the arithmetic logic unit and operating systems. The operating system itself, what, what are these processes and threads and all the rest of these strange terms. Security concerns, yeah. What does the oper operating system do for you with regard to security and the particular privilege attacks and attack protection, blah, blah, blah. And then virtualization, cloud architecture and big data. Cool. So it's a kind of a, a strange... Uh, group of topics. So let's start from the very beginning. So um, the term computer has been around for quite some time. There's a really cool thing in the book where they showed an, uh, an article from 1892. Uh, they were recruiting computers. Well, because a person who does computation is a computer. So it was actually an ad for a mathematician, but it, it says, you know, hire now hiring computers. Cool. Um, towards the end of, uh, well, during World War II, computers really became kind of the forefront of, of their their rise to fame. Anyway, uh, von Neumann, uh, you may have heard that term. If not, that's okay. Uh, wrote a report that basically talked about the, the use of their computers, and they were using them to, to produce the tables that the artillery people were using. You know, if I raise the, you know, the barrel elevation to 22 degrees and I have this much powder in the, how far is the shell going to go? So it was a, a set of tables for different types of projectiles and different types of, of powder loads and different barrel elevations. Very complex math that was done on a computer. Anyway, so he produced a report that basically said, you know, we can kind of kind of organize this a little differently. We could, we could say that all computers require the following. And, uh, they, they talked about uh, a, a, a central arithmetic unit, basically what we would call the, the, the traditional CPU part, some sort of a control unit, memory, and input and output. So basically all those things were mimicked from the human brain. You know, the central arithmetic, central control, and memory were, you know, the, the, the most appropriate analog was the human brain. And the input and output, well, those were human senses, you know, the, the speech for output and hearing for input, you know, not that those computers had that. I'm just talking from an analogy point of view. That's what they were thinking. So there's a figure there that shows this kind of a setup. And so this is 1945. And believe it or not, this is um, pretty doggone accurate uh, today. This is not bad. This is not bad at all. So this green thing basically is the, the, the computer part. Inside we have a central processing unit which contains the control unit and the arithmetic unit. And then we have some sort of memory and then we have some sort of input and out some sort of output. So things really haven't changed. And in fact, um, often uh, <clears throat> if a CPU manufacturer is going to produce something that's kind of oddball, they, they'll, <clears throat> they'll even go out of their way and say this is a non von Neumann architecture to let you know that, for example, maybe the memory unit is someplace else, just to let you know. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> that's the way computers work then, and that's basically the way they work now. And they just shrunk them down, obviously, to the size of a, a postage stamp. Um, next thing to talk about is the, the, the programming itself, how that actually evolved over time. Um, there's two basically two basic types of programming languages. That's that's being a little generous, but I'm, I'm following what they have in the book. Um, declarative programming. Declarative programming is where you have discrete statements that say, you know, go do this, then go do that, then go do that, you know, boom, 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 boom. Uh, and those work very well. Most of the languages are declarative languages. And then there's the thing called functional programming. And functional programming the statements look more like math equations where you're telling the computer to go off and you know perform some sort of calculation and you know produce what the answer is okay and that's 
kind of sort of appropriate from a from the context of what we're getting ready to talk about. So that's what CPUs look like. Hooray! On page 381, they start talking about the operating system because in the old days, when you bought an IBM mainframe computer and it was installed, they said, okay, here's your computer, thank you very much, and uh, here's the instruction manual, uh, see you later. Um, there was no operating system and you had to write whatever, you had to write everything from scratch. So you wrote how to do absolutely everything. For example, if I wanted to print the letter A out on a printout, I had to write some code that printed out the letter A on the printout and advanced the one, one more space so I can print the letter B. All that was done by the, the programmers at, the, at the, the vendor site. I mean, I'm sorry, at the customer site. You know, the, the IBM folks didn't have a set of routines that they were going to be providing for you. They didn't have that. So <clears throat> the IBM came up with this really cool name called SHARE. I love this, SHARE. Anyway, it's Society to Help Alleviate Redundant Effort, SHARE. What they did is they got all their customers together and says, you know, isn't it kind of dumb that each one of you guys have to write a bunch of code that, make, that prints the letter A out on the printer? I mean, uh, why don't we just kind of get together and get a collection of these things? And so whenever it comes time for you to print something out, you can just go borrow this piece of code so you won't have to do it over again. Because there was a hell of a lot of reinventing the wheel. I mean, every single customer of theirs was writing the same software over and over and over. And they thought, well, you know, this is, if we could do this, we could sell more computers, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So that's how it worked. And then eventually they realized, you know, instead of having our customers do all that, why don't we just do that? Why don't we just collect a whole bunch of these things and we'll have them baked into the computer that we sell you. So next time we roll a computer off the loading dock and plunk it in and hand you the manual, the manual is going to have already how to read from a card reader, how to read from a tape, how to print to a printer. It's going to have all these functions already built in. All you have to do is just invoke some sort of a magic, you know, magic spell with your wand to, to make that actually happen. So that was the beginning of operating systems was just the, the frustration that everyone was writing things over and over again and it just seemed kind of dumb. Okay. So modern operating systems basically have a, 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 what I would call a, a layer of abstraction. That's a good term, by the way. So here are the users up here at the top and <clears throat> whatever application that they're running. And then the operating system sits between the user application and the actual hardware. So <clears throat> I don't have to write. Uh, how to go to the printer because the operating system is going to be getting in between me and the actual printer. Cool. So that's the way that works. It's a level of abstraction. So the way you call into this is what's called a system call. In other words, I want to evoke some sort of a thing that the operating system does for a living, like display a character on a screen, or read a character from, from the keyboard, or play a sound on the speaker, I would ask the operating system to do that for me rather than me writing the actual code. So, system calls. And um, the whole idea behind this is that if I was to go in here and start talking directly to the hardware, it is quite possible that I could accidentally mess things up. I could get down into memory and start overriding memory and, and crash this person's application. It could happen. So. If you were to think of this as minimizing the invasive calls down into the system. So I know it's a strange concept, but just bear with me. So for example, um, here's a hard drive and here I am up here in a, a application and I want to delete a file. Well, I don't go directly down to the hard drive and say, okay, Mr. Hard Drive, I'm going to delete you. That's not the way it works. You have to go through the operating system first. So that provides the operating system a chance before it goes off and deletes the file. It says, now wait a minute, um, do you have permissions to do this? Because if, if you didn't, if you were able to bypass the operating system and go directly to the disk and read and write changes to the disk, well then there would be no security on your computer at all. 
So yes, this this little piece right here, this operating piece is definitely required, absolutely, positively. So just like in modern computers, a, an ordinary user, someone who's not an administrator, can't really do that much harm. If you had a virus, for example, that invaded your machine and you were just an ordinary user, well, yeah, it could mess up all of your files. It could, it could delete all of your photos and mess with all your Word documents, things of that nature, but it, it couldn't mess with somebody else's files on that same machine or it couldn't mess up the operating system because you don't have permissions to own those files. So, for example, if I want to change Notepad, I want to go in there and edit the Notepad file, notepad.exe. I want to go in there and change that. I don't have the right kind of permissions for that. Okay, cool. I think we beat that. So essentially what happens is the operating system operates in two different modes, so to speak. They have a, a privileged mode called the kernel mode, and then a user mode, which is all the rest of these things. So it, it's basically split down the middle here, where the lower half is has, has permissions basically to do everything, and then the upper half is the things that the actual users go to. So inside a running application, for example, um, you could see how much of that was, um, well, I'll tell you what, let's just bring up, uh, this is just task manager. Okay, so I've turned on the little button here that says show processes from other users. And what this basically is telling me is which one of the processes belong to me, which one is in the user space, and which ones of these processes are in the kernel space. And you can tell by the username. So that one belongs to me, and that one belongs to me, and that one belongs. So I'm running Internet Explorer, but I'm not running uh, whatever the heck that is, and I'm not running whatever the heck that is. That's the, that's the land manager security prompt thing. Uh, so all these things that, that ha most of them are not me. So the, the kernel mode is running all of these background tasks. Uh, for example, think about it this way. If I get to the login prompt, right, at a computer, that's running in the kernel mode because I'm not really a user yet. And once I get become a user, well, then everything that I do is in the user mode. Kind of makes sense. Okay. Um, in the old days, you know, back in the DOS days, there was no difference. There was there was no kernel mode and user mode, and so a user could do anything they wanted. Uh, so, if a user wanted to overwrite memory, fine, go right ahead. If a user wanted to skip the the DOS operating system and and go delete a file, sure, go right ahead. But that's just not the way they're built now. So there's there's basically a brick wall between the two. So. For example, this application for uh, this is DWM. That's that's my device manager for the display. Display device manager guy, my Windows manager. Anyway, uh, that so I can change desktops and move things around. That's what this guy does. So that guy can't be messed with with by anyone else because it's mine. Okay, so it provides isolation among the users. This user's you know applications can't mess with this user's application so everything is basically in little silos which is good okay cool <clears throat> um on page 384 they start talking about the components uh, of a system and the first thing to talk about is is multitasking so multitasking is i instead of just waiting for one thing to stop before I start up another, I'm going to run multiple things simultaneously. And we do this all the time. We're multitasking right now. I've got, obviously, I've got lots of different applications up and running right this very second. So multitasking. I'll oh, doggone it. This is a good place to stop for the 15-minute mark. We'll pick this thing up again in just a few.